Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Adventures Travel Club television show. We just got off the airplane, and here we are at the airport in Paris. And oh, my goodness sakes, we're just going to hit the ground running today, I'll tell you, because we had a nice flight over, and uh, we have so much to see on this particular trip. You know, yeah. the first part of our show, we're going to go up to uh, the northern part of uh France. We're going to visit Normandy and also Brittany. But let's meet our guide right now and be on our way. And indeed, we are complete uh, 45 passengers. And that will be the size of our group. Well, we do have 45 people, huh? Including yeah. us, huh, Betty? That was a <laughs> lot of people. But did you notice how refreshed they looked oh, when yeah. they got off the plane? So it was a good flight. Did you sleep on the plane? No, I never sleep on you the plane. Oh, I say that, but I must doze, but <laughs> not like you. And the Roman legions were conquering most of Europe. There were Celtic people living here. One of the many Celtic tribes that were living in a very big part of, uh, of West Europe, uh, further north and further east, were Germanic tribes. And the Romans did not really uh, conquer uh, most of the Germanic tribes. But they certainly uh, took all of uh, what we nowadays call France. Well, it's true. When you study the history of uh, all of Western Europe, you realize that the uh, Romans were in there for a long, long time and did some absolutely marvelous things. On this particular trip, it's going to be a little bit different, because, especially this particular show, because we're headed up to Lisieux, France, and uh, we are going to go on a, on a pilgrimage. In fact, the whole trip is a pilgrimage. As we start, uh, we're going to go to the... Uh, see the village where uh, St. Therese lived and uh, where she also was in the monastery or what they call the Carmel and we will talk more about that as we uh, get into the show. But it's very very exciting. I had never been in this part of France before and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Didn't you Betty? Yeah I love the green. You know so many places make you think of Ireland don't they or England mm -hmm. wherever I mean over there in Europe so much of the countryside looks the same but I guess that's the same in California. Yeah, except they get a little more rain than we do. Yeah, yeah well, that's why. <laughs> and that's, of course, why everything is yeah, so green. Yeah. And it really is quite beautiful. We're also going to visit on uh, this series of programs. Uh, we're going to visit the uh, battlefields in Normandy. And uh, we have a real treat for you because it, it, we happen to be, it won't be on this show, maybe the next one. We happen to be there on Memorial Day. And it was absolutely incredible. We'd forgotten that it was Memorial Day because they celebrated on Sunday. And, of course, over here we celebrate it on uh, Monday. Now here we are in Le Zoo, and this is the Carmel, or this is the monastery where St. Therese uh, stayed and uh, of course she went into it. We're going to have more explanation uh, about this because our spiritual director was Monsignor Pat McCormick and he's going to give us a good explanation and a good history about St. Therese and also how she is related to the Diocese of Fresno here in California. So let's listen to the Good Father. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In the course of their journey, Jesus came to a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who sat down at the Lord's feet and listened to him speaking. Now Martha, who was distracted with all the serving, said to Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister is leaving me to do all the serving by myself? Please tell her to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, he said, your worry and fret about so many things, and yet few of these need to be done. It is Mary who has chosen the better part. It is not to be taken from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. You know, the diocese was founded in 1922, and its first bishop was Bishop McGinley. And he made his first oblimina visit in the year 1924-1925. Um, and um, at that time, after his trip to Rome, he actually came here because in Rome, it was the Holy Father 
who said that he would give St. Teresa of Child Jesus to the Diocese of Fresno as its patroness. And so when he came here, he came asking for a privilege, and that was to receive a relic of St. Therese. Now, if you go outside the chapel and immediately to your left, you'll find over here in a cove um, to my left outside uh, the names of all of the siblings of Therese of the Child Jesus. And one of them is Pauline. She's the one who's just after um, Therese's name. She was the superior of this convent for a while. And so Bishop McGinley actually talked with her because she didn't pass away until 1940. And so when Bishop McGinley was here, he asked if the Diocese of Fresno, who was going to be the first diocese in the world to receive St. Therese, of uh, the child Jesus as its patron, could receive a relic. And um, the reason why he wanted this relic was because the Pope said, in order for you to receive this saint as your patroness, you must build her a shrine. So you'll find the shrine in Fresno at Flora, Dora, and Wishon. And at Flora, Dora, and Wishon is the shrine of St. Therese. And in that shrine, in the safe, is the gift that um, Pauline, who was um, Mother Agnes of the Child Jesus, gave to him. It's a handheld relic that the pastor every year on the feast of St. Therese, October 1st, um, takes out this relic and offers um, everyone in the church a blessing from the relic. When you look around this chapel um, here at the Carmel, you'll find names of various people who claimed that they had received from St. Therese their prayer being answered. And back in the early 50s and late 50s and on into the early 60s, you would find many crutches and, and other types of um, in, uh, things that were used by people who had illnesses. And this was a very pl wonderful place to come um, as World War I came to an end because there were many people in World War I who had a great devotion to St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. And the devotion to her now has picked up again because it was just a few years ago that the relics of St. Therese really traveled around the world. She's the patroness of the missions and those relics came into the United States and was for a time at the Carmel in Carmel, California. And um, many of us went there to see those beautiful relics. Um, and you'll see the reliquary um, at the Basilica tomorrow when we make a visit. So this is a time to pray. It's a pray, time to pray for healing, time to pray for the special gift of Teresa and her ability to bring about through her prayers for us on our behalf, a miracle from Jesus, son of the living God. And just as we leave today, you wanna to go there to my left again in this opening great arch with the two great angels above it. And you'll see there a wax figure of St. Teresa, the child Jesus and um, hopefully it's there. And inside of it are some of the bones that they found when they exhumed her. She said to, the, to this, her sisters in Carmel, don't bother digging me up because you're not gonna find much. The only thing they did find that was really intact um, was the bone of the arm that she wrote her story of a soul. Please stand and let us pray. This altar today is found in the, the sacristy here at the convent um, in Lisieux. And so the Carmelites redid the chapel where you just saw mass. And this is the altar that St. Therese cleaned when she was a novice and also when she was a sister who took care of the altar as she lived here. And you'll notice the angels at the bottom and um, the sacred heart of Jesus um, at the tabernacle. And this was the altar at which mass then was said for the sisters um, all through up till probably in the mid, um, six, late 60s. Um, so we just wanted you to make sure that you could see this beautiful uh, piece of art, um, which is here in the sacristy at the Carmel in Lisieux. This is the plaque that is um, on the wall at the right as you enter into the chapel here in Lisieux at the Carmelite convent. And you'll notice at the top is the name of St. Teresa the Child Jesus. Um, these who are underneath are her sisters. 
And you'll notice that uh, Celine um, died in 1959. But the interesting person is Pauline. Pauline was the first to enter the Carmel, and she was the religious um, sister who then became the mother of the house, the superior. And um, Bishop McGinley, the first bishop of the Diocese of Fresno, came here once the bishop uh, the, had been given the permission to have St. Teresa, the child Jesus, as the major patroness of the Diocese of Fresno. So he traveled here in 1925, and as he was here, he received a relic from Pauline, Sister Agnes of, of Jesus, and um, that relic is now at the Shrine of St. Therese in Fresno, California at Floridora and Maroa. It's a handheld relic, so the pastor every year on the anniversary of her death, um, which is celebrated October 1st, um, at that Mass he blesses those who have gathered for that celebration with that precious relic received by Bishop McGinley and brought back to the Diocese of Fresno in 1925. This gives us a really a good uh, little history about St. Therese and also her sisters who were sisters. Yes, but he's a very fine person to be able to give this. He's always had such a great devotion to St. Therese. Yes, that's true. So he's yeah, got he the background for us. And we're going now to the Basilica. And this also has a very interesting history because this was built before World War II. However, it was not consecrated until after World War II. And uh, Monsignor McCormick is also going to give us an explanation uh, here at the Basilica. And this, you have to take a real close look, as you will, of the beautiful oh, mosaics yes. that are in this gorgeous church. This chapel was begun and actually finished in 1932. Now, the reason why the church was not dedicated until 1959 was because you can never um, dedicate a church and place oil in the 12 major pillars of that church until the church is paid off. So the church stood for a number of years until it finally became the, had the ability to be consecrated by the Cardinal who came here in 1959. But the sisters gathered here um, after World War II had begun and in the 40s they were actually bombing Lisieux. The sisters came right to this chapel in 1944 and they prayed to St. Therese to protect them. It wasn't until 1945 when the American forces came into Lisieux and began to check around the whole area um, that they um, noticed that there was a, a bomb. A bomb that had landed in the top of the cupola outside the big dome that has the cross on top. But the bomb never went off. And so the sisters, even to this day, thank God for St. Therese for the fact that in their prayers to her, she protected them for this whole church, this basilica, being totally destroyed, and all the sisters of Carmel in it. And even to today, every year, the sisters give thanks and the Carmel again for that time of being allowed to be safe um, in the time of bombing here in Lisieux. Today, we find that one of the main themes of St. Therese, you must become as a little child, you know, in her early days, she died at 24. She was the mistress of novices. And so she taught the novices the little way and used oftentimes, by taking the, the novices out to the rose garden, using the rose garden as an example of what it means to grow in holiness. Never saying that the thorns are taken away, but to say that in life there will be thorns, but ultimately what blossoms forth is the wonderful gift of the rose. It is then in our simplicity and in our humbleness that we truly can become children of God, placing all things in His hands and trusting and having confidence in Him. This was her little way, and she taught this way to the novices. And I believe that some of her teachings are still being taught today in the same Carmel of which she lived so many years ago. Well, as I said before, you know, the mosaics that you can see here are just phenomenal. We see a lot of mosaics in a lot of churches around Europe and, of course, here in the United States, too. But I think this particular one, Betty, just was breathtaking, especially down here. We were in the, 
uh, I would say the crypt, but it's not yeah. a crypt church. I think this is down down below. I I have, you know like you say we've been to so many, but I have never seen anything quite as spectacular as this with the colors. Mm -hmm. They were they were just came and hit you in the eye, yeah, so that's to true. speak, didn't they? And, and we're looking now at pictures, of course, of the Martin family, and uh, this sort of gives a uh, chronological uh, history here, of course, of, uh, of St. Therese, also of her family, too. And yeah. on these shows, uh, as we are in Normandy, we are going to visit the place where she was also born on another program, and, uh, of course, where she passed away, I believe it was here at the Carmel. And we can see this wonderful because they had so many photographs, actual photographs of her. And how many saints does that happen No, to? Well, I mean, she's a pretty recent saint, right. you know, for that. But uh, the, the family name was Martin. We talk about That's Martin. Right. And of course, when they assume their vows, take their vows as uh, in cloistered nuns, or all of the all of them do, they lose their last. No, not anymore, huh? They do. We do yeah, know their last yeah, names yeah, now. Right. Yeah, that's but true. I don't know about the cloistered though. This is a picture of her as she played Joan of Arc. Now yeah. they had they did some theatrical performances, of course, uh, in the in the Carmel or the monastery there. And there we see also a picture. I believe this was probably on, uh, on some of her bed. on her deathbed. Probably yeah. some of her last days that were here and there. But there are a lot of wonderful uh, memorabilia that's here. And now we're in the upper church right now. And of course, this is what Betty was saying, the vibrant colors that you can see here in the in the church. And it's 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 huge. I mean, it is really, really a large, large church. It's too bad it wasn't brighter, lighter, you know, so much light for it, because you still miss some of that That's tremendous true. color. Now, this is a relic. This is uh, St. Therese's arm, the bone from her arm. And, of course, that has been kept in a reliquary here, right in the center of the basilica. And uh, this uh, is something, of course, that she had said before she died. She said, you dig me up, you're not going to find many parts of me. So I, 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 how did she know she was going to be a saint? I don't know that. But I mean, you know, because usually they do dig saints up and some of them are incorrupt uh, that we will see later on in this series of programs when we uh, see St. Catherine Labore when they when they uh, exhumed her body uh, many, many years after she died, her body was still very pliable and it looked just like she had just gone to sleep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, as what we're looking at now is the top of the dome and uh, Monsignor stated that uh, it was during World War II, I guess, when uh, the Allies bombed the Sioux that uh, there was a bomb that was stuck up there in that uh, cupola of the, is that, a, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, I think so. Is that, okay, yeah, close enough, cupola. right? I would say Coop, cupola. Cupola, cupola, yeah, whatever, yeah. Uh -huh. That's the name of a director in Hollywood, too, isn't it? Coppola? Francis Ford. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Coppola, yeah. yeah. Anyway, the uh, the bomb was up there, and, of course, then they, they took it out, and then, I guess, it detonated it because it didn't go off uh, while the nuns were there because that's where they took refuge was here in the uh, in the basilica. Yeah, but you made that sound so inconsequential. That was a tremendous thing if, if that they just happened to find a bomb. Well, they were looking for stuff. I, I don't suppose they really thought they were going to find something, you but know, think how they must have felt. Well, uh, relieved. Better to, <laughs> yes, better to, <laughs> better to have felt it and felt the <laughs> impact, felt the impact of, of it. Of yeah. it right. yeah. There are many, many programs, of course, that come here to Lisu to, uh, to visit the places here where uh, St. Therese lived and uh, where she also did her writings here as well. And if you haven't picked up uh, her little book, uh, her, her writings, it's so interesting. In fact, her life story, I think, is so interesting because she died at a very, very young age of tuberculosis. And the impact, though, that she has made through uh, the church and, and through history, I mean, since the, the time that she did pass away, uh, has been absolutely yeah. phenomenal. But, you know, she wanted to be a missionary in the world's worst way. And, of course, her health would never have provided for that to allow her to have that. So she had said that she would spend her time in heaven praying for the ones in the missions to right. make yeah, so they have a real patroness in saint therese that's that's for sure and her order too this is now a close-up of you can see of the relic of uh, of her arm and again some of the mosaics that we see in this church again that you know i i could have stayed there for just hours upon hours just looking at uh, all of the artwork here you you don't really appreciate appreciate it. I mean, y when yeah. you, you're in and, and you're out. But we did have time to spend here, which was very, very good. It was nice. There were a group of uh, children 
that were uh, on pilgrimage here. And of course, we can see some of them here. Uh, and I believe they were all from France. And there were, there were a number of them. In fact, we kept running into them uh, all over the area where we were here. But there's a big conference center here at the Basilica. And uh, they're set up for pilgrims. And so it's a place not to miss if you go into Normandy. And uh, I, would, I would really recommend that you do go to this. It's yes. a beautiful place. And of course, the history here is absolutely fantastic. And you don't have to be a Catholic to no, enjoy all. all of this. The artistic value of it is fantastic. It is. It's, it's something. And uh, next time we go, we'll uh, spend a little bit more time there, too. That's what I like, you know, especially if we can go back again, because now you know what to look for sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that the truth? Oh, it's, it's wonderful. And it, just, it was great also to see all of these school children that were here on the grounds and that they were uh, visiting here and they visited the Carmel. And we saw them all over the place and it was just really wonderful. I think they were getting a good value out of this as well. Terence was born at Alençon the 2nd of January 1873 into a well-off family. Her father was a jeweler and clock maker and her mother was a maker of Alençon point lace. She was the ninth of the family which mourned the death of four children, two of which were boys. In August 1877, Madame Martin died. Thérèse was four and a half years old. The first part of her life ended that day. In November 1877, the five orphans arrived with their father at the Buissonnet. This house has been a place of pilgrimage since 1913. It has never been changed. It is maintained using the gifts of the many people who come to visit the place where Thérèse spent 11 years of her childhood. If you move towards the window, to the right of the fireplace, you can see the dining room where the family had their meals each day. It was in this room that Thérèse had her last meal, the day before she entered the Carmelite order. She was 15 years old. The furniture is authentic. The clock is signed Louis Martin. The entrance hall, which you are in at the moment, was the kitchen. The fireplace reminds us of the evenings the family spent together and the grace which Thérèse received at Christmas in 1886. She was nearly 14 years old. In the story of a soul, Thérèse writes, My sisters treated me like a baby. A small miracle was required to make me grow up all of a sudden. It was on the 25th of December, 1886, that the grace was given to me to leave my childhood behind me. In a word, the grace for my complete conversion. On arriving at the Brissonnet, after midnight mass, I was used to finding my shoes full of Christmas treats, just like when I was small. Uh, the voices that you were hearing were uh, the narration inside the house where the Martin family lived. Now we're going to go over to St. Peter's Cathedral. This was built at the end of the 12th century. However, since the, the Napoleon Concordat of uh, the year 1802, there's no longer a bishop in residence. However, the church, as we can see inside, is really quite old. Of course, it was, it was, I think it was started actually in the 11th century as such. But this is where the Martin family uh, went to Mass on Sundays. And here, Betty, you see, we're familiar oh, with this. Yes. The statue of St. Peter, the yes. same one, uh, a smaller version of the one that is in the Vatican at, at St. Peter's Basilica in uh, Rome. I think the difference that we see now, too, in this cathedral, Marv, is it hasn't been, re I was going to say reconditioned, but it hasn't mm -hmm. been restored to the fullest extent as far as the paintings and the the walls themselves, uh, they, it looks almost dirty. They haven't, they, you know, how they usually scrub them or sand them and take all that I think you have a sandblast to get all the Sandblast to get it, off, get it off. off. But the enormity of it, the ceilings, those, the arches, it's, that's Gothic, right? Yes, uh -huh, very so. much so. Uh -huh. Now, uh, the high, uh, that's the organ that we just saw right there, and there's the confessional, and that's where... St. Teresa went to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation, and she said, it was a great joy for me every time I went to confession. And uh, this is the area, of course, where her whole family prayed. And we're going to take a look in just a moment to see the high altar. Now, the high altar was a donation by her father, and he gave that in the year 1888. The stained glass, of course, of St. Peter being crucified upside down. Betty, her father was 
uh, I mean, he made watches and yeah. was a was a watchmaker. But I, I think it must have been a very affluent family because w we visited the homes where they lived, and these were extremely nice. Yeah. And to be able to donate an altar like we're seeing right here to that cathedral, you know, had to cost a few French francs in those well, days. Well, of course, but don't forget, he gave his daughters to charity to the uh, nunnery, so he didn't have to spend. He didn't have <laughs> girls at home to have to spend money on. <laughs> That's but, true, but, they did. but we know all that we, we know from yeah. all of the things that we saw that he he was wealthy man. I don't know whether it was from her side of the family or what, but he was very free with his money. He was a great donor for everything. Uh, and, and of course, if you've seen the movie, uh, uh, Therese, uh, which played here in town not too well. I guess it was this last year. Uh, you you get a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, view of the whole history of of the family. It was done so well. It was so nice. Yeah, it was so sad that the, of the children they had. Was it four daughters that he had, and then the two sons, and the two sons died. They passed away. Yeah, that's right. yeah, and she, uh, the mother died at such a young age. I saw when we were there that they are going to start beatification. Uh, for th the mother and the father. Oh, really? Oh, yes, that's uh -huh. wonderful. That's great. Well, that takes forever, but yes, they, they does, really yeah. are going to start. The uh, there's a picture here uh, that we'll see in a moment. There's there's a statue of uh, oh, Joni of Joan of Arc, right? Yeah, but there's a picture of the Holy Face, and Therese would spend time, a lot of time, in front of this picture, uh, praying. And uh, it's probably it here is. where she there said where she probably made her decision that she did want to enter uh, the monastery, the Carmel, and become a nun. And it's it's so interesting too, as Father explained a little bit earlier, that her sister was the uh, prioress. Uh, prioress, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was trying to think of the of the name. Anyway, this is uh, uh, this is not the same picture, but this is uh, the identical picture. One, the other one was placed then in the monastery. Now that picture is taken from Veronica's when she wiped the face of well, Jesus. Well that's what I think and I'm not positive on that but I, when I took these pictures I, I thought gee Winnie Christmas isn't that isn't that the picture I that... Th uh, I think so. I yeah. really think so. It doesn't have that identification on the bottom of it but I am sure that that's what that is. I, th I think it probably was too. Hey, that's all the time we have. We'll see you next time. If you're interested in any of our trips, give Betty a call. Our phone number is? 488-7443. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.